We've got a couple of questions here, and they're related to each other. I'm not sure quite how to handle these. The first question is, why does one have to have a teacher to do this work? You don't have to have a teacher to do this work. You can continue to do this work in your imagination, which means not do the work at all. We can't do anything, so we can't really do the work. And so there's the first reason. Why do you have to have a teacher? You've got to have somebody to remind you you can't do anything, because clearly we can't remind ourselves. Why can't we remind ourselves? Well, because we're not awake. We have to remember ourselves. We have to wake up a little bit before we can remind ourselves of anything. What do we need to remind ourselves about? We need to remind ourselves of our aim. But what good is that if you remind yourself of your aim, but you can't remember that you can't do anything? Well, you can't. And it's interesting. This question goes with another question I got from someone who listened to a number of podcasts and said, if I can't do anything and everything I think is wrong, and everything I do is wrong, and everything I'm going to do is wrong, and it's all wrong, then what's the point? Then if no thoughts that I have are my own thoughts, if they're all false personality, then blah, 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 blah. And it was just this big negative thing. And I wanted to write back and say, well, you can't do this work. So because I didn't write back to her and say that, I'm telling you now, you can't do this work. Some people cannot do the work. Some people just, they can't do it. That's all. It's just not for them. They have to go some other way. They have to go possibly the way of the monk, which is just devotion, so that they can turn their will over to someone else and just obey what someone else says and just love and be devoted to some master, some guru, and only do that. And that's their way. That's how the love comes up against all of the things, all of the many eyes inside of them. And if their love is strong enough, the friction will be there with the many eyes. If their love is strong enough, the eyes will fight it. And when the eyes fight it, what will happen is that will cause friction. And that friction will cause things to solidify and eyes will have to go and there's something that will have to be formed and hopefully real eye will be formed and then someone will have real will. Somebody says, okay, do this. I want you to do this. I want you to meditate for eight hours without moving. You can imagine that that's going to be a challenge for someone's love and devotion because the body is not going to want to do that. The mind is not going to want to do that. And the emotions don't want anything to do with that. So you've got three centers, four centers already involved, and none of them want to do that. So you're going to have major friction. And it doesn't have to be eight hours. You could say three hours, and you're going to have major friction. Now, for us, three hours may seem doable. Now, three hours is doable. If I asked you to sit with me for three hours, I think it's doable. I think you could do it. If I said, okay, I want to try this. I want all of us to sit for three hours. It doesn't have to be not moving but I don't want you squirming around. I want you to sit for three hours with your eyes closed and I want you to meditate. I want you to do Vipassana for three hours. Is there anybody really thinks they couldn't do that? No. See, we all think that's doable. Eight's really pressing it. It's like, you can't be serious. Some people can't do the work. Why does one have to have a teacher to do this work? Why does one have to have a map to find their way in a foreign country? Why does one have to have a navigational system out at sea in a sailboat? Because that's how you find your way. You have to have someone who has gone before and who has seen this is the way this works, this doesn't work. You have to have someone who is willing to create a space for you to live your life in as an experiment. See, this is an experiment. You are the laboratory. You are experimenting on yourself, on your own self. And that's not easy to do all by yourself. It's a lot easier with a group, but it's, I think it's probably impossible without a teacher. I've never been able to make it very far without a teacher. And I've found that the distance that I have made it without a teacher, many times I've had to backtrack and then fix it. Or many times I've had to go over it again because being my own teacher isn't really that great. Now, in another sense, everybody already has a teacher. If you're really doing this work, what this work will do is it will make life your teacher. But again, you need to be awake because most of us aren't there yet. Because at the level that we come into this work, we come into it at a very low level. When I say a very low level, I mean we're asleep. We're basically unconscious. We're walking around unconscious. And it's only by being taught how to observe, how to separate, how to separate one part of you from another part of you and have one part of you be the designated observer and have the right part of you be the designated observer. You can't designate a drunk to be the designated driver and have your purpose served. You have to designate something that can actually observe in order to have a designated observer. And you need a teacher for that.
You need a teacher to at least point that out. Why do you need a teacher? Because I can't see this work being passed on any other way. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is there anything else about that? Anyone? I thought of something. What did you think of? I thought of that also, we do not know ourselves. And that's one of the greatest obstacles. That's a great point. We're liars. We are incredible liars. And we are so deceived by these pictures, by this beautiful album. We all keep an album, a family album. Of course, the only person in the family album is me. And all of the pictures are of me. And they're all glorious, beautiful, wonderful pictures. Oh, here's the time I won the championship chess tournament. Oh, here's the time I won the three million meter race. Oh, here's the time that I gave away $10 million. Here's the time that I saved everybody in my whole family from dying. Here's the time that... And we have all these things. Most of our favorite memories never happened. But even the ones that did happen, we embellish so much that there's no way to find the truth in them anymore, or rarely any way to find the truth in them anymore. So what we have to do is we have to begin to break through all of these pictures, all of these ideas of ourselves, and it's not easy. As some of you may remember yesterday, it's a very unpleasant experience when someone is confronted on something they do not want to let go of. And the things that we don't want to let go of are in that album, and we clutch it tight. It's a treasure chest for us. It's a treasure trove. And we are not willing to give up one thing without a fight. This is the idea of sacrifice in the work. The idea that you must sacrifice something. The thing is, is that what you're asked to sacrifice is never real. You're only asked to sacrifice what is unreal. And these pictures of you are lies and they are unreal. But they are the last thing in the world that you want to let go of. You'll easily, happily give up what's real to have what's unreal. Think about it. How much money do Americans spend on entertainment, going to the movies to sit for 90 minutes and experience something unreal, just something that will entertain them and take them away from any kind of consciousness, any kind of awareness, any kind of work, any kind of reality? I rest my case.